Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Facebook Live and webinar about the research and data as tools and advocates' decision making, our latest report from Fondalytics. Uh, I'm joined here by five members from different research organizations. We're going to use this report as a way to have a great conversation about how to make research more accessible for the average advocate and make them their decision making more informed and evidence based and hopefully having a better impact on the animals. So we're going to start off with a very short explanation of what the report actually covers. And then we're going to jump into some interesting questions for our five amazing guests. So I'm going to start by screen sharing one of the most exciting parts of the report. Um, in our report, we found that there are five main uses of research in animal advocacy. And this framework can be very helpful for both researchers and advocates alike when they think about how to use the research. The first use of research is external legitimacy. This is basically a way to demonstrate to people outside of the movement that we are driven by logic as well as empathy, that we are not just you know, people who have pets or like animals, that there is real science-based reasons to do what we do and to lend legitimacy to our cause. The second one is internal decision-making. This allows us to set priorities, make campaign targets. This can even include um, data about how specific projects within the organization work or things across the entire movement. This can even include polling data for legislative officials, anything like that. The third use of, of research is building partnerships to figure out potential collaborative opportunities, especially with groups within other movements, ways to intersect for with the climate movement, for example, food justice, um, the labor rights movement, or even within the animal advocacy movement between different branches, wild animal advocacy, farmed animal advocacy. This is a way to build partnership. The fourth use is to catalyze action. It helps audiences connect animal topics to other salient issues. So for example, um, a study that demonstrates that a plant-based burger is just as healthy or even healthier than an animal-based burger is a good way to kind of get people to think about the issues in their daily, their daily consum consumption choices. Um, ways to to show that um, uh, default veg options, for example, are a good way to lower the climate cost of a cafeteria. These are ways to catalyze action and get people to actually make changes, both from individuals or from decision makers or institutional leaders. And then the fifth and final use of research is to identify problems and solutions. So this can include the data about how many animals are farmed in different countries in the world or psychological research into why people may be averse or, or more inclined to, to make different consumption choices on their meal plates. Um, this can even include um, predictions about the future or future trends. So thinking about these five different uses of advocacy can be helpful for both researchers when they think about what their research paper is going to do and for advocates because they may need to conduct research about their own organization. Our report also has a bunch of recommendations for both advocates and researchers that we have. So advocates should be sharing their research plans and, and maximize learning and <laughs> decrease redundancy. They should also be expanding coordination efforts and try to create something called a meta theory of change where all the different arms of animal advocacy could be linked together in some sort of grand theory. Um, this might be quite difficult, but by collaborating more between organizations, um, we can make progress in creating something like a meta theory of change. Finally, advocates should build in time and resources to understand the research. I know that there, this is a movement with limited funding and limited um, talent, uh, but even given that, the more time that we can spend trying to understand research and evidence and the data, the more evidence-based and more impactful we're going to be. But that's not all of it. As researchers, we also have things that we should be doing. We should focus on knowledge translation. In other words, we should make sure that the research isn't just going to the um, other researchers. We, we need to make sure it's getting in the hands of advocates themselves in a digestible, easily accessible way. 
Um, we should be adding details about the quality and legitimacy into the research itself. This is also called metadata because this can help with the knowledge translation and dissemination and even the legitimacy of the research that we create. We should also be giving frameworks to organizations to help improve the diffusion of knowledge. So if in, it's not, the report shows that it's not good enough to just hand off research <laughs> to people. We need to have a framework for understanding this. Um, this could be specific roles, um, specific people who are doing this. This could be specific mechanisms within your organization to make sure that the research is understood. And finally, and as evidenced by this very call right now, we should be collaborating more between ourselves. We should be talking, communicating, talking about our priorities, talking about what we're working on, what we should be working on, what we should be focusing less time on. Um, and I think that's a great transition because this is a moment of collaboration and communication. With that, I'd like to hand it off to our five amazing guests here today. I'd like each of you to introduce yourself to our audience. Um, and we'll start with Joe who is my colleague here at Bonalytics. Yes, hi everyone. Thanks Bjorn. Uh, my name is Joe Anderson. I am the research director at Faunalytics. I will pass it over to Jacob. Hi all, uh, my name is Jacob Peacock. Uh, I'm a research manager at Rethink Priorities. And I'll pass it over to Courtney. Hello, um, and apologies for my voice because I'm sick today, but I'm Courtney Dillard, and I'm the social change researcher at Mercy for Animals, and I will pass it to Alina. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Alina, and I am a researcher on the programs team at Animal Charity Evaluators. And I guess, yeah, there's only one person left. So. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I am Jose. And uh, I work at Animal Ask as Global Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator. Great, thank you so much for the five of you for taking time to have this conversation. I really think this is important both for other advocates and for ourselves as research organizations and people interested in data to benefit the movement. So first of all, I just wanna open it up. Um, obviously the report has been out for a little while. All of you have read it. What do you think are the key takeaways from the report? What really stuck out to you as you read it? Do you want us to raise hands? You can go, talk? yeah, just talk, go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe not, not surprisingly, a lot of organizations said they lack really lack the capacity and the time to synthesize all of the research that is out there and they really need more resources. Um, that are doing exactly that, um, which is great because a bunch of organizations are doing that at the moment. Um, so that was one of them. Um, the other one that I found really interesting was to try and involve advocates way earlier rather than just translating the knowledge that we create so that they can understand it, involving them much earlier in what topics do we actually research and what are the research questions that will actually help you on the ground. I like that observation and I agree. I think that, um, I, I think it will get more buy-in if we have uh, the conversations with advocates, um, you know, earlier on. The other thing that was of interest to me and I can see a lot of evidence of a shift in this is that there's need, there's more of a need for research that demonstrates how what, what, what will help us be most effective? And so there's a, the, there are a lot of these questions being asked now, and I think they're obviously some of the most fundamental. Um, and then that requires perhaps an engagement in different disciplines than we have previously, more um, engagement by political scientists and uh, economists and, and, and people um, yeah, who are thinking about a lot of the institutional change uh, mechanisms. Yeah, I thought it was uh, also notable that a lot of organizations sort of identify as tactic flexible, but calls inflexible. So that was a nice way of putting that. Um, and that sort of matches my observation and experience. Um, and, and it's, I, I'm curious, maybe other folks have an opinion on this, whether this means we should try to shift organizations to be more cause flexible, potentially, um, or whether, you know, sort of the right play as researchers is that we should be trying to work to influence charity incubators and funders and the, you know, it, at the, the 
time and the place where these organizations are being uh, founded or started and try to get them, uh, yeah, trying to kind of ex exercise cause flexibility there. That's a great point, Jacob. So the report found that they are tactic flexible, which means they're willing to change how they go about making change, essentially, whether it be legislative or, you know, a protest or a social media campaign. But the cause they're interested in is usually inflexible. So they have um, no interest in changing what types of animals they're, they're trying to change, they're trying to impact or things like that. So I like the question you asked, what, what does everybody think? Do you think we should be trying to do more research to change this flexibility about causes? Or do you think that we should stick to what the research report found and, and focus more on the flexibility of the tactics themselves? Well, if I, if I can jump in, um, I don't know if I have the answers to that questions, but I think I wanted to add something to what Jacob just said. And it is that this concept of tactic flexible and cause inflexible, um, I think it might point both to the strong philosophical foundations of the modern animal advocacy movement, but also to the limits that philanthropy's preference uh, somewhat uh, might be exerting to, towards uh, groups. And that's something that we should be addressing um, trying to approach and uh, somehow help all stakeholders to come together and talk and make agreements and find common ground. I think that's a really good point, Jose. And the one other thing I'd say also in, in response to um, that idea of tactic flexible, cause inflexible, which also really jumped out to me, um, is while I'm no expert, I know that there are limitations on how much flexibility organizations can have in the causes that they support. Things are baked into mission statements that are registered with governments and can't be changed. Um, so I think part of the solution is certainly what you're talking about, Jacob, of um, thinking about organizations when they're founded, but I also really lean into the idea of supporting a range of different types of advocacy being as effective as they can be. Um, basically, I think we need both, and I wouldn't want to emphasize one too strongly over the other, given the limitations of all the knowledge we have now. There's more research than there ever has been, but we still are pretty aware, I think, all of us of the the limits of what we know about which things are most effective or ineffective. Hi, I'm Jiaying and I lead research and strategy at Good Growth. I think one thing that I noticed and like really struck me from the report is how research and like what makes it useful or impactful differs depending on who the target stakeholder is. So for example, if you're an advocate that's trying to influence a policymaker versus the public, um, the kind, even if you're using it for the same purpose, like you're trying to change behavior or you're trying to add like, credibility and legitimacy, um, the type of data or also the way that you present that data and the tone um, could be very different depending who that stakeholder is. Um, and then I guess like, since our focus is very much on Asia, um, another thing that we found quite interesting is how in the West there's this like post-truth orientation. People are like, very skeptical potentially of like data, whereas that's much less true um, in the global South. Um, so I think it speaks to this idea that, that the end user is really important to understand if we're trying to make research um, impactful. So yeah, I think that also builds into the point that other speakers have made about the need to engage with, or at least like have an understanding of the end user of the research prior to designing um, the research itself. I think with good growth, there's an interesting intersection of some different topics that are being brought up. So we do two types of research one which is open access and we do a lot of that in partnership with analytics um, and then the other type is very client driven and 
our clients are often like international organizations who are looking to enter Asia and trying to figure out what to do. So actually our experience of these organizations is that they're not um, pause and flexible um, because often they're trying to figure out, you know, what, I guess like what species to target um, or, or support or help. Um, and then what types of interventions, which I guess maybe is more tactic related. Um, and then like, which level to engage in, which is maybe tactic or strategy. Um, and maybe this is begging the question of what is the definition of tactic versus cause? I'd like to ask a little bit about the five uses of research that I talked about in the beginning. Do you think your organization um, tends to conduct research that falls into a few of those five categories? Like, do you specialize in any of those types? And if so, why do you think your organization has made that prioritization decision? Yeah, I think for us, the one we probably prioritize the most is internal decision making. So we use research to guide our grant making decisions, our recommendations decisions. Um, we also probably use it to identify call, the course areas that we prioritize the most. And to a lesser extent, I would say that it's also important for our legitimacy. So it's one of our guiding principles to be evidence led and to try and update when, when we get new evidence. So um, I think it's also really important that our research reviews are really well, uh, sorry, our charity reviews are really well researched um, in, in terms of yeah, creating more legitimacy. Um, and yeah, I think this is maybe partly because we're not an original research organization, but we use we use research that other people produce to try and make the best decisions that we can. And that's why we prioritize the ones that we do. I would say it, and that, oh, sorry. oh. Courtney, go, go ahead. Right oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say at Mercy for Animals, uh, a lot of the research I've been involved with is about um, external legitimacy. Uh, and that there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I will say that it, when you were discussing the partnerships, uh, one partnership that we have really uh, valued is with academics. Um, and that uh, I think deserves a, a, a bit of focus. And, and I think academics are often eager uh, to do research that has meaning. Um, and they offer a great value as a collaborator because of legitimacy. So I've been involved in several studies where Mercy for Animals is not present in any way uh, in uh, the, the obvious research uh, product. Um, and I think that uh, we've asked the questions, we have found uh, academic collaborators to help us answer them, and then we have uh, demonstrated or um, Decide, yeah, dem disseminate that information without um, MFA, MFA's involvement, uh, or at least not uh, obvious involvement, and that, that does help our legitimacy. Well, I think that's really clever, Kearney. I love it. Uh, well, from us, I think um, for Animal Ask, uh, not particularly, no. Um, we, as an animal uh, research consultancy, we tend to prioritize the needs that groups have and giving more weight to those with the potential to impact more animals and reduce more suffering. So we are basically asking advocates what they think we should be uh, researching and trying to attend their needs. So I don't think I would, uh, we are like uh, um, prioritizing uh, any particular um, category uh, in this case. It's interesting that you make that point though, Jose, because that comes back to this idea of more like co-creation of research with the people who are going to use it. And I don't want to take us too far away from the, the point of the question, but um, it's a balancing act that I think at Faunalytics we've certainly thought a lot about and I'm not sure that we've found quite the right balance yet between um, really stakeholder engaged co-creation of research with people who will then action it, which obviously is very impactful for at least that group, but you wonder how generalizable it'll be to other groups. So we are always trying to find a way of, of a middle ground between working with individual groups um, to try and 
help them meet their needs in particular, but also to keep it generalizable enough that other groups doing similar things can use the results as well. And it's such a tricky balancing act. Um, I'm not sure if any of the others of you kind of walk that same line, but I'd be interested to hear if you do. Yeah, I, I think, think this is a great question. question. Oh, go ahead, Neon. I was just saying that's a great question. The balance and act between something very actionable for one group, but not generalizable. How do you think your organizations have tread that line? Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, and I think in our case, we uh, also tread this line, especially a lot of our work is sort of oriented towards uh, maybe identifying problems and solutions, uh, but primarily working with funders. Um, and kind of the worst case scenario for generalizability, um, and maybe not in the usual research sense, but is a situation where it's confidential work for that funder, and we're basically not going to be able to disseminate it, um, which even if it were generalizable, it just won't be generalized um, due to confidentiality. Um, but yeah, this is like a, an important trade-off that I don't really think there's a perfect way to make, uh, and it probably makes sense to fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, we certainly try to publicize as much of our work as possible and try to um, urge our audience to uh, publicize the work and, and not make confidential requests, uh, although it certainly is still something we accommodate. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's challenging. Has anybody else been navigating that balance or do you think that your work doesn't really have that gray area? Maybe organization only works in generalizable data or the opposite. If I if I might add, um, well, we are certainly um, trying to, to balance the need here because working with groups in particular, um, in particular uh, asks or consultancies is just one of the programs we are offering to the movement. Uh, we have other two uh, programs, one of them being movement strategy research. Uh, in this one, um, we, we work in foundational research uh, uh, for potentially high impact opportunities that may be neglected by the movement. And for example, uh, this year, uh, we plan to investigate various ideas, including shareholder activism, policy benchmarking, or opportunities with the international uh, politics. So um, I think that balance certainly is challenging. And the approach, uh, we, we don't have like clear answers, but uh, diversifying for us seems as a tactic that uh, is at least um cautious uh, in in light of uncertainties yeah i think maybe in a slightly different way but i do think that as an organization we are trying to find that balance and getting better at it but still not perfect at it um like i said we mainly use research to guide our internal decisions and that's because our theory of change mainly works through moving money to where it's best spent um, so we need to know, we need to know what the evidence says about where the money should be going. Um, but I think especially in the past, we have tried to also be an organization that informs the movement, be it by doing original research, by writing research briefs or literature reviews and things like that. Um, and we have just found over time that A, we just don't have the capacity, our team is very small, um, and B, there's now other organizations who are probably better suited at doing that kind of work. So we are now really specializing on the former and whenever we have a project that we feel like it's a low lift to also make it available to the movement, then, then we do that. But our, yeah, our focus is really on the former now to use it internally. So at Good Growth, I would say we have a mix of um, different uses. Uh, we have two types of research. So one, which is open access um, available to everyone in the animal advocacy movement. And a lot of that is um, working in partnership with Phonetics. So that covers multiple uses, I would say. Um, and then the other kind is client-driven research. And our clients are actually often international organizations that are um, thinking of coming into Asia or, or growing in Asia and trying to figure out how. And so I think 
there's an interesting intersection with the previous discussion about um, tactics and causes. Um, and I guess it might depend a little bit about on like what we actually mean by cause, but the organizations that we work with are um, often considering like not only what types of interventions or strategies um, or like target audiences, but also what types of species that they should be working on, what types of farming systems um, or, or what level uh, like at which to try to influence change. And so, yeah, I guess that's like a little different from our experience. Um, it For us, the organizations that we work with are quite cause flexible or at least in search um, of causes and tactics that would work um, in Asia. Um, I'd like to switch gears to talk about knowledge translation and knowledge dissemination. So this was a definitely a recurring theme in the report. Um, both advocates found it difficult to access information at all times. And it's also difficult from the researcher side to fully translate and disseminate all of the research at once because it's not an easy feat. Knowledge translation is quite difficult. So tell me, how has your organization been going about this in the past? Um, we'll start there. We'll start with what you've done in the past, and then I want to transition to what do you think we can be doing more in the future? So what has your organization already been doing? I can start us off if you want. Um, Phonolytics has a long history, obviously, and we started off uh, doing, well, everyone does what they can manage with their capacity. So we started off doing relatively passive dissemination. It's become more active over time as we have more capability and, and just time for uh, trying to reach more people. Um, and I think one of the more exciting things technically passed and that it's already happening, but relatively new for us um, is the existence of Bjorn, our moderator, uh, who's a research liaison who is intended, um, his role is intended uh, to really bridge that gap between the research team like myself um, and the advocates that we hope are engaging with the work that we do because we recognize that there is a gap there often and that it can be really hard to overcome, especially, I will just speak to myself, for nerdy researchers who don't always speak the same language as everyone else and forget that the things that they're saying aren't necessarily self-explanatory. Um, so having that kind of role for us as an organization who are really focused on advocates and, and liaising with them um, is really exciting, but also still quite new for us. I'll just piggyback on that. I, I really feel like Phonolix is doing a great job of uh, disseminating uh, research uh, findings um, uh, through a variety of channels. And I'm most excited about the targeted dissemination. And that's something I think that I could do better or Mercy for Animals could do better is we often put out our um, research reports on the farmed animal strategy team list um, and that uh, we do have trackable links so we understand who's opened it at least if only if they've spent a, a minute we won't know that but um, and we've done a few webinars uh, but what I would like to do more of is to establish at the beginning of a research project stakeholders in the space that could benefit from the findings um, and ways to reach out to them in a personalized way, um, manner. Uh, because I think what, oftentimes you get done with the research and you're kind of like done, done, done. Um, and then you, so you need to kind of build that in up front um, and get excited about who might make use of your research. Yeah, maybe our main way of disseminating research is promoting the work of phonolytics. <laughs> but in, in, in terms of what we do ourselves, um, we have our monthly research newsletter where we um, inform the movement about all the, all the research that we're aware of that came out on farmed animal advocacy in the past month. And we do like short, lay person friendly summaries of that in our ACE newsletter. Um, this is regularly one of people's favorite features of our writing. So we were thinking about how to expand that more and how to make that maybe more infographic based, less text based. Um, 
And then we're also currently working, and I've spoken to a few of you about this already, we're working on a system for tracking um, evidence for different interventions that is dynamic, that we can update over time, um, that is sort of short and succinct, and that we can use to guide our evaluations and grant making decisions, but that we can hopefully also share with the, with the movement later on. Um, yeah, and um, I'm hoping that that will be useful given how many of the advocates that were interviewed said we really need more like synthesis and state of the evidence kind of summaries. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we are a small team. Uh, we uh, certainly um, potential to growth in this aspect. Uh, we have uh, uh, basically uh, disseminated information through some usual channels, such as website, uh, newsletters, uh, EA forum. Uh, but we are working on this, trying to improve. Uh, I'm the, post, the person responsible for it. But I would like to take a step back and give a shout out to some of uh, uh, within priorities work with the Animal Advocacy Strategy Forum, because I think that's really this a really important uh, meeting uh, of both advocates and researchers when they can talk to one another uh, personally and, and ask questions, uh, express doubts. And I would love to see that grow. Um, I have chapters in different regions of the world for people to encounter each other and just uh, mingle and ask questions and find common ground. Yeah, thank you, Jose. And I'm glad that's been useful. I, I will say I can't personally take much of any credit for that. Uh, but uh, I review some strategies, some planning documents here and there for that uh, event. Um, I, and I was going to add, sort of in that same vein, that one of the dissemination strategies that Rethink has experimented with over the last year or so, uh, very often our reports are like pretty directly oriented towards a particular stakeholder in the first place. Um, so we will uh, do a lot more hand delivery than we have previously. Um, even stakeholders who we regard as like very sophisticated and like, you know, we might hope would like read the whole report uh, once it was sent to them. Uh, we, we are still doing like basically one-on-one -on -one or like very small group sorts of webinar conversation, like walkthrough. We did A, B, and C. We found E, D, and F uh, very like detailed. Um, and I, I don't want to say like, you know, obviously people are busy and don't have time to read things, but uh, I've also found this just like, in addition to simulating a lot of engagement can like close the feedback loop faster of like, oh, question, the researchers are right here. You can answer it. Um, so that's another uh, useful approach that we found, if time consuming. I'd say a large part of our current dissemination strategy is partnering with Fonalytics. Um, I think in the past, we explored trying to share more broadly by going to conferences and so forth. Um, but I, I'm not sure that that's the greatest return on investment given, you know, there's a limited number of people at, at conferences. Whereas with analytics, um, we now do partnered research. And so I I think the analytics team does a lot of the work now. Um, and in, in the near future of publishing um, and disseminating the, the work that we do together, which um, I think makes things a lot more efficient actually, because they've spent 20 years building this audience and different channels. Um, so that's more for the open access research. And then on the client side, like I definitely, you know, we also face the challenge um, that Jacob mentions that, you know, we do these confidential reports. Um, and I guess like for us, it's often like very deep research. A um, lot of time goes into it. And at the same time, many organizations are asking very similar questions. Um, and on top of that, some of those questions are being answered using public data sets. Um, and so one thing that we're looking to do, also in partnership with Analytics, is develop uh, country profiles um, for the different countries in um, Southeast Asia that we're currently uh, focused on and trying to aggregate the these public data sets and the, the questions that they can answer um, in, a, in a place that is publicly accessible which means that um, there's still going to be 
sort of proprietary or like custom research that we might need to do based on the needs of specific organizations. But there's also like this base of like foundational understanding that we can just make available to all advocates with no you know extra charge. And I think that also makes things um, potentially a lot more efficient um, from the research and funding standpoint. Other strategies for dissemination, knowledge translation, getting the research into the hands of people who need it. Are there any strategies that you're particularly excited by from any other organization? It could be an organization here, uh, like Jose, you shouted out Rethink Priorities, or another organization who's not present here today. Anything that you think is really exciting? I think it's pretty exciting what you were talking about, Alina. Um, start starting to um, catalog the evidence for different interventions. It aligns with some work that we're doing a little bit more uh, informally in the meantime, uh, that Bjorn, again, is spearheading, uh, pulling together evidence on particular interventions. But I think for you in the role that you're at, um, Ace, I mean, um, the position you play in the movement, having you capture those things uh, all in one place about interventions makes so much sense. And so, yeah, I love that for you. Um, and I also do want to shout out uh, Good Growth. Um, Jai Ying will be digitally imposed into our conversation at a later time due to time zone issues. Um, but they are really, I think, leading the way on a lot of the research um, looking into how to better engage with stakeholders, how to co-create research, um, understand needs. Uh, I think they're way ahead of the game and uh, learning a lot that that we're learning from them. So I'm really excited about that as well. I, I totally agree with that, Joe. Uh, I was going to say the same, the, the, this project by, by the Good Growth, because um, besides, I think that they, are, they already did it with the, the um, uh, alternative protein aspect of uh, engagement, but they are trying to do it now with the animal advocacy side of the movement. And that's really exciting. And I think uh, it's something that, as you say, is way ahead of of other, other intents of working research. Actually, I'm yeah. so, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just want to really quickly tack on about Good Growth because they are um, also uh, replicating and extending this report itself. So I feel like that's exciting to mention as well, that they're going to be doing some more research along these lines in Southeast Asia and um, hopefully building on what we've learned and what we're talking about today. But apologies for interrupting you, Alina. No, no, no worries. Um yeah, generally, when we were doing the research to start our own sort of synthesis project, it was just really exciting to see how many of these are happening at the moment. I think I spoke to people from almost all of your organizations about meta-analyses that you're doing, impact evaluations that you're doing, um, which is really cool. Um, I love the idea of the blog post series that Phonalytics is, is going to do on these, these sort of mini meta-analyses for advocates summarizing like the evidence that is really relevant for them on not just what interventions work, but under what conditions they work best versus not so good. Um, and then maybe something slightly different, but I've really enjoyed being in the impactful animal advocacy Slack group um, because researchers are just available there to answer questions about their research in real time. It kind of puts a face to the, to the, um, to the research as well. Um, I really loved the office hours that welfare footprint have been holding where they just where they're just available for an hour to just chat about their research and ask answer questions and talk to advocates about how they can use it in their own work oh uh, i guess first of all I just want to thank um joe and jose for that um those shout outs uh yeah just no pressure just gotta live up to these um descriptions now um, I guess then for us, uh, we've seen some research that has also inspired um, our thinking. So I guess going back to this idea that we we can engage with stakeholders or research users throughout the research process um, and not necessarily only at the end doing translation. Um, so we've seen 
um, organization researchers use some interesting methods like um, Animal Alliance Asia. They use uh, country forums to understand the landscape of different um, Asian countries, challenges, opportunities, and so forth by bringing uh, different advocates together virtually or in person um, to collect that information. But I guess also there's some level of like analysis and synthesis that happens when you bring people together and they they think through um, the, the problem and the data together. And I think there's also like an additional value of just connecting people and building that relationship through this research process that might then later lead to partnerships or um, you know new projects happening. So I think this is really interesting because it is a different look at research. There's research as a methodology itself, but then there's also this like kind of intervention side of things where you get other benefits through the research process. Those are all some really exciting ways that the, the movement is making the research more accessible. Finally, I just wanted to ask, there are challenges that we're facing. Um, we have challenges of funding. We have challenges of accessibility. We have challenges of communication. What are your biggest ideas about how we can overcome any of these? Or how are your organizations trying to overcome these challenges of um, making our our movement more evidence-based. I know that there's a lot of directions we can go with this, and I think this speaks to a lot of the inherent difficulties of what we're doing. So speak to whatever you think that your organization is doing very well at this point. Well, I can start and say this is something we would like to be doing very well. We're doing well, and we'd like to do it very well, which is to bake in research into our project planning. So that from the beginning, when a project is being considered, whether it's a campaign um, or it's a particular uh, um, corporate engagement um, interest or something of that nature, that the research team um, interfaces with the team who's leading the project and sees where we can be of help. Uh, and we can provide desk research to them. We could do um, some A-B testing. Uh, so I, I think it's that that's a really important element that has been very difficult is because a lot of people are operating at different speeds in the research team, a much faster speed within the organization trying to get things done. And so we have to um, at least be available early on to see if we can provide uh, you know, existing findings that could be of use or set up really quick kinds of ways in which we can test some things. Uh, and then then I think we have more, there's a lot more interest on the part of teams if we can adjust a little bit to their time schedule. And also um, that there's there's a sense from leadership that, re that, that strategy must be informed by research. Yeah, something I found really striking when reading the report was that the biggest knowledge gap seems to be what works. <laughs> How do we create change for animals? And that's just that's really interesting because that's the point of our movement. And that's where people have the most kind of uncertainties around. Um, and that's a challenge for us because we're meant to tell people where to donate <laughs> and what interventions to prioritize. Um and we're also obviously always trying to get better at that, but um, something we're trying to do at the moment is to identify what the biggest open questions for us are, um, trying to find a way to then liaise with research, or research organizations to see how and whether we can close these gaps. Um, and I guess as a movement, we maybe need to let go of the idea that we have to do RCTs about everything because it's just not possible for our research questions to have a randomized controlled trial to and manipulate someone's diet for 20 years or whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess we'll have to use the best evidence that we have. And that is sometimes yeah, using evidence from other movements, from other social movements that have eff like effectively created change, using more longitudinal designs. Um, yeah, 
So yeah, I think one of the key challenges is that it's really hard to answer our research questions with the methods that I'm, I'm, I'm an academic psychological researcher and the methods that I'm trained in using don't really work in our field. So yeah, using, synthesizing different methods um, to try and get to a relatively confident assessment. I think that's such a great point, Alina. And I also uh, really liked the theme that you were talking about of uh, collaboratively setting a research agenda or polling, you know, for what the open questions are. And that's something that we're thinking a lot about too at Phonolytics. And I know other organizations are as well. I've had a number of conversations with different people in the last few years about the need to really do that in a more systematic way. So we have a number of uh, different things that we're pursuing as a result of this report. Um, this is just one of them and the rest are on the website. I won't bore you with all of them, but I am really excited about this year, just kind of doing more outreach to find out what people are thinking are the open questions. What are the highest priority questions? What are people already doing to establish this shared agenda? Because there is no point in five different groups doing it at the same time. And if someone else is further ahead than we are, then I would absolutely rather they take the lead on that and that we all contribute. Um, I think we need to lean more into that kind of thing. And it's just a matter of making the time, finding the time uh, to do that deeper outreach that's needed. Um, but we have so much knowledge amongst all the different research groups and advocacy groups. Um, yeah, just getting out there and talking to everyone. Um, and if I can throw in one other thing that I'm excited about, this is just a pilot that we're trying out this year, but one of the other challenges I think is research is happening on a small scale in a lot of places, usually internal to organizations and nobody else ever learns about it. I won't say I'm 100% confident that we can make this work, but we are hoping to maybe bridge that gap by crowdsourcing monitoring and evaluation data from organizations that if groups are willing to share with us some of their privately collected data about the impact of their interventions, and if, lots of ifs, we can pull together enough on a similar type of intervention, then we're hoping that we will be able to use that to pull out some more generalizable findings that in, could inform things like the uh, intervention summaries you're talking about at ACE. Um, something that we're going to try, and if anyone watching is interested in sharing some data for that, definitely hit us up. Um, but yeah, I think we all we all know a lot individually, and we just need to bring all of that together into one room. Well, um, one thing I really like of uh, Animal Ask is that we are, on the one hand, trying to the best of our abilities to answer the big questions for the movement, what what work best, what is uh, better to avoid, or what the strategies, what theories of change, how to uh, reduce uh, factory farming as much as possible with uh, our work. And on the other hand, we are trying to um, ask, uh, to answer, sorry, specific questions that serves groups in their uh, campaigns, in their interventions, trying to serve them um, as much as we can and trying to accompany them all, all along the process, not just uh, producing reports, but uh, um, taking, taking with them, trying to solve their doubts along the way. And I think that's something really valuable and we don't have all the answers for, for sure. Who has? But I think that's something I I, I feel it's it's really um, valuable for the movement. I think the biggest challenge, um, and this comes up in the report as well, is how do we get advocates to integrate research findings into their everyday work? Really, um, be it like updating their strategy or changing. You know, what, what they might be putting into campaigns or um, coming up with new interventions. And I think the challenge is like, there isn't necessarily a predefined block of time or like, a, you know, a bullet point in your job description that is 
dedicated to this, right? Um, and in the report it mentions like, you know, we have to like squeeze out time to do this knowledge translation because it's not covered in like the project budget and so forth. Um, I think that's a real challenge and it's really demanding um, to ask advocates to add that into the already very busy schedules. So one thing that we're um, working on at Good Growth this year is our research to action lab. Um, and that's really looking at um, how do we create a process, which you know can look like a two hour workshop, for example, um, where we help do that synthesis and we guide advocates through the process of taking insights, um, analyzing them, identifying opportunities, um, coming up with new ideas, and then um, testing and prototyping those ideas uh, to see if they can turn into new strategies or interventions. Um, we are trying to do this like as part of existing events like conferences or retreats so that we're not asking advocates to carve out a bunch of new time to do that. And we're trying to really integrate into existing processes and events and, and spaces that advocates are already um, engaging with. And yeah, I guess also uh, feeding into this is what Joe has mentioned that we'll also be um, doing a, a similar study that really focuses um, on Asian advocates and like really just understanding what is their what is their process of um, engaging with research look like so that we can design ways of um, integrating research into the ways that they're already working. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of your answers. I think that's going to wrap up our conversation here today. Um, for everybody watching, thank you so much for learning more about how research is used in the movement. I want to I want to shout out again all of the organizations who are here today. If you want to see more of their research, we're going to include links to their websites and some of their research projects in the description of wherever you happen to be watching this. Uh, we strongly recommend that you check them out. If you have more questions about our specific report, data and um, the research and data as tools and ad advocates decision making, you can come to our office hours or read the full report, which will be linked in the description as well. Um, and I want to say one more time, thank you to everybody who came and participated. Uh, I hope that this leads to more collaboration between researchers, and I hope that this leads to more um, conversations between researchers and advocates, because that's really where the nitty gritty of of this movement um, comes from. Thank you all again. <laughs>